very good evening aspirants welcome to the hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by shankar ias academy for the date 11th of august 2022 displayed here are the list of news articles that we have chosen for today's discussion and in today's discussion i had made a point to cover each and every topic in both your prelims perspective as well as mains perspective and note that this is definitely going to be very much useful for your entire upsc preparation okay So without wasting much time now let's get into the news article discussion have a look at this news article the news article is about a project implemented through an international collaboration it is the project circular economy solutions preventing marine litter in ecosystems from the name itself it is clear that the project is about conserving marine environment okay so let us see the details of this project in the discussion before that we'll understand what is marine litter and india's position in it okay see marine litter refers to any persistent manufactured or processed solid material which is discarded or disposed of or abandoned in the marine and coastal environment okay See thousands of pieces of trash are estimated to be afloat on every square mile of ocean which are the marine litter it consists of items that have been made or used by people and deliberately discarded into the sea or rivers or on the beaches it also includes the items that are brought indirectly to the sea through rivers sewage storm water or winds See additionally items that are accidentally lost at sea is also termed as marine litter. So from this it is clear that marine litter originates from many sources. The issue is it causes a wide spectrum of impacts such as environmental, economic, safety related, health and cultural impacts. Mainly marine plastic litter or marine plastic pollution is a major global environmental problem because it has a very slow rate of degradation see what effects it has it harms marine species as they ingest those plastics or get entangled in them and sometimes die then it violates the integrity of ecosystems and it inhibits growth of marine plants then it also accumulates and transports pathogens that may cause disease and injuries to marine animals plants and humans finally it partly ends up in the food chain also see there will be direct economic losses due to reduced fishery yields declining amenity for tourism and damage to shipping and related infrastructure but from where this marine plastic comes majorly it comes from land around 80 percentage comes from land based plastic pollution which are as a result of plastic packaging and short lived products originating from various consumer products okay see this includes plastic bags single and multi layer food and beverage containers then cleaning and personal care product containers synthetic textiles etc etc all these when discarded or disposed of are carried by wind and rain and they end up into streams and rivers which then takes them to the oceans other than this marine plastic also comes from fisheries aquaculture nautical activities and illegal dumping into the sea so what you need to understand is marine litter also includes marine plastic litter but not limited to it Okay marine litter demands immediate attention as scientists warn that by the year 2050 the quantity of plastics in the oceans will outweigh fish that is why countries having significant coastlines need appropriate action plans see india is an important country in this regard am i right we know india has a coastline of roughly 7000 kilometers 
but still we lack effective waste management leading to solid waste and plastic waste ending up in the indian ocean due to this india not only remains one of the world's largest producer of plastic but also one of the largest sources of marine litter also okay so to address this problem the project is implemented it is implemented through indo german partnership where the german society for international cooperation will be collaborating with the indian environment ministry okay currently it is being implemented in three indian states who are they kerala tamil nadu and uttar pradesh and primarily the project is aimed at enhancing those practices that will prevent plastic from entering the marine environment from this it involves circular economy solutions See circular economy is a model of production and consumption it involves sharing leasing reusing repairing refurbishing and recycling existing materials and products such as plastics see it focuses on extending the life cycle of products so the number of products being discarded or disposed of is reduced in this so the project includes these measures first is implementation of the international obligation to avoid marine litter then organizing national and international dialogues along with this tracking and monitoring marine litter and reporting about it will also be done then the project will be providing technical support enable capacity building and develop digital communication platform for this purpose see it will also demonstrate technical solutions for the 3 hours of plastics that is reduction reuse and recycling of plastics additionally it will support the national extended producer responsibility framework of india that is epr this is because implementing the extended producer responsibility will ensure the realization of 3 hours that is reduction reuse and recycling of plastics See this is with the involvement of private sector actors and informal sector workers in the waste sector okay see the private sector actors will include the recyclers and the packaging industry here involvement of informal sector is an advantage because the entire system of collection sorting and processing residential waste depends largely on the work of millions of informal waste collectors and scrap dealers Okay so that's all about this news article see in this news article our main thought was to cover about circular economy solutions preventing marine litter in ecosystem see in order to understand this project we need to understand what is marine litter and we should know that marine plastic litter is a part of marine litter so all these things we discussed in this discussion see these points all know you can use both for your prelims as well as mains in a preliminary examination you might expect a question depending on the marine litter or whether marine plastic litter is a part of marine litter or the whole sum of marine litter is itself is equal to marine plastic litter so these kinds of statements can confuse you very well here in this discussion i have given a clear explanation of all these and when you ask me about mains no This is a conserving measure that is especially it is for the conservation of marine environment. So whenever you get questions regarding the marine environment conservation you can quote this as an direct example. And since we had seen about the elaborate project or its implementation you can use straight away these points in your main sense and get good scores in your main answers. Okay? So with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion. See this article here this article is with reference to the Chola era Buddha statue which was stolen 20 years back near Kanchipuram now it is stuck with the department of homeland security in the US without any claim having been made by the indian authorities so this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let's revise about the cholas which is very much useful for both your prelims as well as your mains examination okay first of all let us start with the origin of the chola dynasty see the cholas emerged to power in the middle of the 9th century they have overthrown the pallavas in south india 
and they established an empire comprising the major portion of South India. They also extended their control in Sri Lanka and the Malay Peninsula, and therefore they were known as the later Cholas or Imperial Cholas. Okay. Now let's see some prominent pillars of the Chola Empire. Firstly, take Vijayalaya. See, the Chola Empire was founded by Vijayalaya, and he took over Tanjavur Kingdom in the eighth century. and led to the rise of mighty cholas by defeating the pallavas tanjavur was hence made the first capital of the eminent chola empire okay then secondly take aditya 1 who is the son of vijayalaya okay thus he succeeded vijayalaya to become the ruler of the empire and he defeated the king aparajitta and the empire gained massive power under his reign He conquered the Pandya kings along with the Vadumbas and established control over the Pallavas power in the region. And note that since he annexed Tondai Mandalam, he was known as Tondai Kondan. Okay. Next take Rajendra Chola. He succeeded the mighty Raja Raja Chola. Rajendra I was the first to venture to the banks of Ganges. He was popularly called the Victor of the Ganges. His new empire capital was called the Gangai Konda Cholapuram, where he received the title of Gangai Konda. Okay, this period is referred to as the Golden Age of the Cholas. See, after his rule, the kingdom witnessed a widespread downfall. However, during the reign of Clothunga I, who was the grandson of Rajendra I, Sri Lanka became independent. Rajendra III was the last Chola king who was defeated by Jatavarman Sundra Pandya II. Thus, the Chola Empire was absorbed into the Pandya Empire. Okay. Now let's see about the art and literature. See, art, religion, and literature benefited greatly during this period. Several Shiva temples were built across the banks of Kaveri River. Tanjavur still stands to be the biggest and tallest among all the temples in India of its time. The Tanjavur Brahadeshwar Temple is adorned with natural color paintings that are a feast for the eyes even today. See, several of these sites have been classified as World Heritage Sites by UNESCO. These include the Brahadeshwar Temple, the Gangai Konda Cholapuram, and the Airavateshwara Temples. Okay. Sculpting and art were also at an all-time high in this reign. Sculptures of gods and goddesses like Shiva, Vishnu, and Lakshmi have been carved out of bronze and serve as a golden reminder of this period. Okay, and note that the Dravidian style of art and architecture reached its perfection under the Cholas. They built enormous temples. The chief feature of the Chola temple is the Vimana. The big temple at Tanjavur built by Raja Raja I is a masterpiece of South Indian art and the architecture. And again, I repeat, note that the big temple at Tanjavur built by Raja Raja I is a masterpiece of South Indian art and architecture. Cholas are also well known for their bronze images. Okay, and note that. The Nandraja idol in the Nageshwara Temple at Kumbagonam is the largest and the finest. Okay, then literature was another crucial highlight of this period. Not only did devotional literature take shape, but Jain and Buddhist writings also got appreciation and recognition during this phase. The popular Nalayira Divya Prabandham from this period is a compilation of. 4000 tamil verses and is widely savored by literary scholars even to this day okay and having done with art architecture and literature let's see about the administration see the cholas had an excellent system of administration the emperor or king was at the top of the administration the land revenue department was well organized and it was called as puravartana kalam All lands were carefully surveyed and classified for assessment of revenue. Okay, note that Clothunga I became famous by abolishing tolls, and he earned the title Sungam Tavirta Choran, which means abolisher of tolls. Okay, 
See, the administration setup was a larger when compared to that of the Cheras, Pandyas and the Pallavas. However, it witnessed a decline after the death of Klothunga I and thereafter the power of local chieftains increased. See, when you talk about the structure, the Rashtriyam or the Rajyam or the Empire consisted of eight mandalams or provinces. And each mandalam had a governor or viceroy, generally a prince. The provinces were further divided into Valanadus or Kotams. And each Valanadus were divided into Nadus or we call it as districts. Okay. And this was under Natar. The Nadus considered of a number of autonomous villages. The Gils or Shinis were also part of the administration. Okay. See the assembly of mercantile groups or merchants was known as Nagaram and was specific to different trades and specialized groups. For example, take Shankarabadi Nagaram where ghee and oil suppliers were there and take the Salya Nagaram and Satsuma Parishata Nagaram which were associated with the textile trade. See the Ayahol in Ayahol, Karnataka and Manigramam were powerful and important guilds and these guilds became more powerful and subsequently independent. See, guilds is nothing but a medieval association of craftsmen or merchants having considerable power. Okay. For example, a group of skilled craftsmen in the same trade might form themselves into a guild. Okay. See, the system of village autonomy with sabhas and their committees developed through the ages and reached its culmination during the Chola rule. Two inscriptions belonging to the period of Parantaka 1 found at Uttaramerur provide details of the formation and functions of village councils. So thus we can understand the administration that is both village administration and provincial administration in this. Now let us move on to the army strength. See the Chola maintained a regular standing army consisting of elephants, cavalry, infantry and navy. About 70 regiments were mentioned in the inscriptions. And then when you talk about the caste system, it was widely prevalent during the Chola period. Brahmins and Kshatriyas enjoyed special privileges. The practice of Sati was prevalent among the royal families. The Devadasi system or dancing girls attached to temples emerged during this period. See, Chola rule was very much significant because of their achievements. In main questions related to arts and culture, you can use examples of Dravidian style of architecture, the bronze statues, etc. from the Chola era. So that is why we made this discussion in a precise manner but in an effective way. So aspirants, you can straight away use these points for enriching your main answer whenever question is coming based on the Chola era or Chola empire. And for preliminary examination, whatever points I mentioned, each and everything is a factual information. So direct questions can be asked from this factual information. Okay. So with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now have a look at this news article. This article talks about freebies. See, a petition was filed in Supreme Court to ban the practice of political parties promising irrational freebies, especially during election time to garner votes. The Election Commission of India told the Supreme Court that freebies in normal times can be lifesavers during a disaster or a pandemic. This is all about the news article. In this context, let's know about what are freebies and we will also discuss about the important points mentioned in the news article. Okay. First of all, what are freebies? See, there is no precise definition of freebies. It is something provided or given free of charge. Provision of free electricity, free water, free public transportation, waiver of pending utility bills and farm loan waivers are often regarded as freebies. It is important to distinguish freebies from public or merit good. For example, public distribution system, employment guarantee schemes, state support for education and health, these are all known as merit goods. Generally, freebies are given to secure vote in the election. Okay. See, public goods are provided for the overall welfare of the society. But according to some experts, these public goods can also be called as freebies because they are provided at free of cost to the general public. 
So, an Indian definition of freebies is yet to be arrived. Okay. You know that a petition was filed to ban the practice of promising irrational freebies during the election time. See, the Election Commission of India has defended freebies in various perspectives. The Election Commission of India told that freebies can have a different impact on society, economy, equity, depending on the situation. For instance, during natural disasters or pandemic, providing life-saving medicine, food, funds may be a life and economic savior. Benefits of cross-subsidization and sector-specific relief to address the different vulnerabilities of sections of society cannot be underestimated. So, the Supreme Court proposed to set up an expert body to study and suggest solutions to the problems of freebies. See, the members of the expert body should be drawn from a wide spectrum of government and non-government bodies. For this, the Election Commission also welcomed this. That is, the Election Commission welcomed the thought of setting up an expert body by the Supreme Court. But the Election Commission of India said it cannot be part of the body because it is not appropriate for the constitutional authority like Election Commission of India to be a part of the expert committee, especially if there are ministers and government bodies in the expert committee, because it may decline the credibility and autonomy of the body. Okay, so that's all about this news article. See, in this news article, we understood what are freebies, especially we understood how to differentiate between freebies and merit goods. Though there is not a well-defined definition for what are freebies, the Election Commission of India says certain things as irrational freebies. And as we saw in this news article, the Supreme Court's proposal of setting up an expert body to study and suggest solutions to the problem of freebies is a very much welcoming solution to the problems created by the freebies. Okay. See, when you take up this discussion, the points that we discussed can be utilized in your mains answers. Like when you are asked about the false promises, that is a kind of freebies that are made by the candidates who are standing in the election to the voters, you can use the points that we discussed today in our discussion because we had discussed what are the problems that are created and we also ended up with the solution. Am I right? So with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. See this open article here. It is about a new global vision for G20. As per the article, the agenda, themes and focus areas which India will set for 2023 is lacking vision. Here you should know why India is setting agenda for G20. Because India is only host to G20 for the year 2023. So this article covers the collaborations and concerns regarding G20. Now we will see them one by one. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this news article is given here for your reference. Just go through it. Now let us start our discussion with some basics. What is G20? The G20 is a strategic multilateral platform connecting the world's major developed and emerging economies. Know that it holds a strategic role in securing future global economic growth and prosperity. Together, the G20 members represent more than 80% of world GDP, 75% of international trade and 60% of world population. Okay. Now, let us see a little bit about origin of G20. See, the G20 was formed in the year 1999 with the aim of discussing policies in order to achieve international financial stability. This forum was formed as an effort to find a solution to the global economic conditions hit by the global financial crisis in 1997 to 1999. So, from the year it was established, that is from 1999, G20 finance ministers and central bank governors began holding meetings. This is to discuss the response to the global financial crisis that occurred. This meeting was started based on the advice of G7 finance ministers. And after nine years, that is in the year 2008, the leaders of the G20 countries gathered for the first G20 summit. 
So till 2008, only finance ministers and central bank governors were only in the meeting. For the first time in the year 2008, leaders of the countries met in the first G20 summit. And on this occasion, the country's leaders coordinated the global response to the impact of the financial crisis that occurred in the US. The global financial crisis of 2008. That is what I'm meaning here. Okay. Now coming to the members. The members of the G20 are Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Canada, China, France, Germany, India, Indonesia, Italy, Japan, Republic of Korea, Mexico, Russia, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, Turkey, then United Kingdom, United States and the European Union. See, Spain is also invited as a permanent guest. Okay. Each year, one member country presides over the meeting. And the presidency invites guest countries which take full part in the G20 exercise. Several international and regional organizations also participate in the G20 meeting. See, I am telling you this point because we had a prelims question this year regarding the observer status of United Nations General Assembly. Who knows, this information might also be in a statement in the next prelims. Am I right? So, know that a non-member can be invited as a permanent guest. We saw just now that the permanent guest here is Spain. And the presidency can invite guests and even international and regional organization to participate in the G20 meetings. Okay. So, if there is a statement in prelims, like non-members can be invited as only temporary guest or regional organization cannot participate, then those statements are incorrect okay now coming to the article as we already saw india is going to be the host for the year 2023 and the article mentions where all collaborations need to be done see according to the author of the news article a fractured world will make the trade-offs more difficult so he is suggesting a new model of international cooperation we are going to see where all changes need to be brought in. First of all, governance needs innovation. This is because the world is becoming steadily equal in all fronts. There is no one superpower anymore. Another reason for the need of innovation is the role of United Nations and the World Trade Organizations in securing cooperation between country groups is losing centrality. As per the author, there are now three socio-economic systems. They include G7, China-Russia and India and the others. And hereafter, they will only set the global agenda. Secondly, there are so many things to be considered when it comes to collaboration regarding the G20 countries. Some of them are Ukraine's rivalry with Russia and the expanding influence of the trade and value chains dominated by the US and China and then the reluctance of developing countries to take sides in the strategic competition, etc, etc. So, this requires fresh thinking from different perspectives in order to achieve collaboration. Thirdly, the primary role of the G20 needs to be reoriented and this needs to be done to prevent a clash of ideas which are detrimental for the global good. The solution lies in a new conceptual model which is based on principles rather than long and fruitful documents. See, the Rio Declaration of 1992 is an appropriate model here. Okay, now these points should be considered by India to guide G20 towards the achievement of collaboration. Now, what all India should keep in mind? As per the author, first of all, India should see collaboration around science and technology. And it should build on resolutions of the United Nations General Assembly and other multilateral bodies. Secondly, like we saw earlier, a new conceptual frame is needed. See, we all are in the same boat when it comes to climate change. I mean, we all are going to face the consequences of anthropogenic climate change. So, this sense of equality needs to be expanded to other areas as well. All should be considered on a same platform when it comes to trade, environment, digital economy, etc. Thirdly, we all know emerging economies are 
no longer considered as a source of problems which need external solutions instead they are considered as a source of solutions to shared problems here brics being an organization of emerging countries provides an appropriate model for governance institutions suitable for the 21st century fourthly there should be global consensus with respect to vienna declaration on human rights 1993 see there is a growing recognition of economic and social rights through the 2030 agenda for sustainable development as given in the sustainable development goals ensuring adequate food housing education health water and sanitation and work for all should guide the international cooperation then fifthly global agenda should be titled towards science and technology instead of investments this is because science and technology are the driving force for economic diversification for sustainably urbanizing the world for assuring the hydrogen economy and new crop varieties and we all know these are the answers to human well-being and global climate change see innovation is needed to move towards renewable sources of energy sixthly the potential of the digital information technology revolution should be harnessed in all ways for this to happen digital access to consumers should be considered as a universal service moreover open access software should be offered to reap the fruits of the new set of network technologies by the society and this open access software can be used for more cost effective service delivery options good governance and sustainable development etc etc seventhly space is the next frontier for finding solutions to problems of natural resource management these problems might range from climate change related natural disasters to urban and infrastructure planning now having said this there should be regional and international collaboration to analyze the earth observation data this collaboration is important because existing centers in different countries have massive computing capacities then they have machine learning and artificial intelligence also only if countries engage in peaceful collaboration they can use the open access to geospatial data data products services and geospatial information technology facilities etc etc this will save them lots of finances which the countries can use for other purposes am i right finally and most importantly public health management factor has to be weighed in especially after the covid 19 covid had taught us that infectious diseases can also lead to market failure apart from this one of the major global challenges is the rapidly growing antimicrobial resistance which needs new antibiotics here also collaboration is important between existing biotechnology facilities so far we saw the areas in which the collaboration is needed as per the author and while concluding the article as a way forward he said that if development is a priority then one must avoid strategic competition he also suggested to revive the global financial transaction tax and this amount should be used to pay to green technology fund for least developed countries and the author suggested india to take into factor all the points that we discussed in this news article this is to guide g20 to a better tomorrow okay so that's all about this news article see in this news article we discuss some basic points about g20 then we saw the g20 members then we talked about the collaboration that the author elaborately discussed see each and every point that is mentioned no you can directly use in your main answers and you can definitely expect these kind of questions that is relating to the world organizations like g20 in your mains so whenever you get such kind of questions utilize these points to enrich your answer and when you ask me about preliminary examination the data that we saw in this especially the member countries the guest status all these no they can be directly put as a preliminary type of questions so aspirants 
this kind of topic that too about G20 is very much relevant for both their preliminary examination and mains examination. So kindly make note of each and every point that we discussed in this news article and revise it for your examination. With these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. See this article here, it is a very important one. The article is about the guidelines for digital lending released by RBI. Digital lending as the name suggests is a process of getting or taking loans through digital platforms. Okay, And RBI to regulate this has released guidelines. In this discussion, let us see the important points mentioned in the news article regarding the guidelines. And we will see why RBI is releasing these guidelines. We shall start the discussion with the question, why RBI is releasing guidelines for digital lending? See, Reserve Bank of India is statutorily mandated to operate the credit system of the country to its advantage. In this endeavor, the Reserve Bank has encouraged innovation in the financial system, which includes different products and credit delivery methods. Here on one hand, RBI encourages innovation and on the other hand, it ensures their orderly growth. Then it preserves financing stability and also ensures protection of depositors and customers' interest. Now coming to today's article, see designing and delivery of credit products and their servicing through digital lending route have acquired prominence in the recent days. However, Certain concerns have also emerged. They include unbridled engagement of third parties, mis-selling, breach of data privacy, unfair business conduct, charging of exorbitant interest rates and unethical recovery practices. So to mitigate this and to protect the confidence of the members of public in the digital lending ecosystem, RBI has released guidelines. See, RBI has constituted a working group on digital lending, including lending through online platforms and mobile apps. It was constituted on January 2021. And based on the inputs from different stakeholders, a regulatory framework has been firmed up. Before moving further, you should know that the universe of digital lenders is classified into three groups. Firstly, entities regulated by the RBI and permitted to carry out lending business. Second one is the entities authorized to carry out lending as per other statutory or regulatory provisions but not regulated by RBI. And thirdly, entities lending outside the purview of any statutory or regulatory provisions. Here, the Reserve Bank's regulatory framework is focused on the digital lending ecosystem of RBI's regulated entities and the lending service providers engaged by them. That is the first category. Okay. For the entities falling in the second category, the respective regulator or controlling authority may consider formulating appropriate rules or regulations on digital lending. That will be based on the recommendations of the working groups on digital lending. Then for the entities in the third category, the working groups on digital lending has suggested specific legislative and institutional interventions for consideration by the central government. This is to curb the illegitimate lending activity being carried out by such entities. Okay. Now let us see the certain requirements mandated by RBI. The points that we are going to see is regarding consumer protection and conduct issues. See, all loan dispersals and repayments are required to be executed only between the bank accounts of the borrowers and the regulated entities. This is without any pass-through or pool account of the legal service providers or any third party. And secondly, any fees, charges, etc. payable to the legal service providers in the credit intimidation process shall be paid directly by the regulated entities and not by the borrower. And thirdly, a standardized key fact statement must be provided to the borrower before executing the loan contract. And fourthly, all inclusive cost of digital loans in the form of annual percentage rate is required to be disclosed to the borrowers. 
and this annual percentage rate shall also form part of the key fact statement then automatic increase in credit limit without explicit consent of borrower is prohibited then lastly a cooling off or look up period during which the borrowers can exit digital loan by paying the principal and the proportionate apr that is the annual percentage rate without any penalty shall be provided as a part of the loan contract okay see i have given here other consumer protection and conduct issues just go through it so that's all about this news article in this news article we covered an important topic that is why rbi is releasing guidelines for digital lending and we saw what are all the guidelines given by them in detail so with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is the preliminary practice question discussion see today we have four questions in that three will be discussing and one will be a quiz question for you see know that we are displaying the quiz question as a poll question so interested aspirants can attend the poll and also the answer for that quiz question will be put up in the comment section of both the poll as well as the video okay now let's look into the first question see it is regarding the marine litter discussion two statements are given so we are going to go through both the statements before arriving at the answer now look at statement 1 marine litter refers exclusively to the plastics and microplastics in the ocean see this statement is incorrect see the term only exclusively entirely all mean the same so the statement says marine litter only refers plastics and microplastics in the oceans already i said in the discussion that marine plastic litter is a part of marine litter and it is not the entire thing am i right so marine litter is not limited to plastics but also other short lived products and marine debris here short lived products would mean those products that have low shelf life or which are used for short duration like the single use plastics or diapers etc etc see the marine debris no that includes these short lived products then it includes metals glass bottles cigarettes straws lids etc etc and also the plastic materials are also included yes you are right marine debris is nothing but another term for marine litter so having seen this now look at statement 2 glass metal synthetic textiles and single use cutlery are termed as marine debris and does not constitute marine litter see this statement is absolutely incorrect just now we saw that marine debris is nothing but another term for marine litter so these are also part of marine litter only okay see read the question carefully you know that statement 1 and 2 are incorrect and note that the question is demanding for incorrect statements so your answer here will be option c both 1 and 2 are incorrect okay now moving on to the second question see this question is regarding the chola era discussion here four statements are given whenever you have multiple statements you can opt for elimination technique am i right see now look at statement 1 rajendra chola built brahadeeshwara temple in tanjavur See if you just know that this statement is incorrect that is it was built by Rajaraja Chola and not Rajendra Chola you can easily arrive at the answer because if you eliminate statement 1 the answer is option D none of the above am i right so that is why i say whenever you have multiple statement questions don't think that you have to know all the statements if you know just one or two statements you will be able to eliminate few options and arrive at the answer either it can be a 100% arrival of the answer or a 50% of it okay now you know that all the statements given here are incorrect now let me give you the correct data as i said in the first statement it was not built by rajendra chola brahadeesha temple was built by rajaraja chola okay and in statement 2 it is wrong because Rajendra 3 was the last Chola ruler okay and when you take statement 3 see the practice of sati was prevalent among the royal families during the Chola era okay then take the last statement 
the devadasi system or dancing girls attached to the temples emerged during the chola period so that statement is also incorrect okay now i have given the correct statement for all the wrong statements by this question you can recall all the facts that we saw in the discussion okay so finally what is the answer for this question since the question is demanding for correct statements your answer here will be option d none of the above okay now let us look at the third question see the third question consists of two statements so whenever we have two statements we'll go through both the statements before arriving at the answer and note that the question is demanding for correct statements okay now look at statement 1 Promises like freebies in the election manifesto is a corrupt practice under section 123 of the Representation of the People Act. See this statement is incorrect because the promises in the election manifesto cannot be construed as corrupt practices under section 123 of the Representation of People's Act. So only politicians are promising freebies. Am I right? Now come to statement 2. The Constitution of India provides for model code of conduct to regulate political parties prior to election. See this statement is absolutely incorrect. Why means it is the Election Commission of India's innovation and it is not provided in the constitution. That is the model code of conduct is the innovation of Election Commission of India and not provided in the Indian constitution. Okay. Now what is the final answer for this? Yes, the final answer is Option D neither one nor two because both the statements here are incorrect now having seen the prelims practice questions let me display you the quiz question for today see this is a very easy question if you are clearly listen to the discussion it is going to be such a easy question so aspirants please go through the question and post your answers in the comment section and finally displayed here is a mains practice question for you see go through the question once and try writing answer for this questions because it will definitely help you to improve your writing skills for your mains examination okay and try posting your answers in the comment section whenever we get time we'll try to evaluate your answers okay and that's all for today's discussion if you like this video do like share and comment and don't forget to subscribe to the shankar ai's academy's youtube channel thank you for listening